Okay, son. Let's go. Praise the Lord. What I'd like you to do is get your notebooks. I'm going to give you this outline, and then we're going to put our notebooks down. However, you need to know that there's sin in the camp. Be sure your sin will find you out. Look at that woman leaving. <laughs> it's crazy lady. Why? The man's given his life to the Lord. You understand? Most preachers bore me with what they said. <laughs> As Dr. Patterson, they believe in church discipline on this campus. And he said he turned it over to the head man. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... You'll be dealt with, woman. <laughs> ah, you're delightful. You got your notebooks? Okay, at the top, put the seven separations of Abraham. The final one is from Isaac. And that's Genesis 22. Now, you'll want to pick up your Bibles and your notebooks when you get to number six. It's going to talk about the mark of the beast. But I will help you if you just out from point six, so you won't... Uh, you're delightful. You got your notebooks? Okay, at the top, put the seven separations of Abraham. And look up here. Once you write separation, make an arrow. Just an arrow pointing. And after the arrow, write the word revelation. The arrow, write the word revelation. Put another arrow. And then write the word worship. Separation. Arrow. Revelation. Arrow. Worship. The final one is from Isaac. And that's Genesis 22. Now you'll want to pick up your Bibles and your notebooks when you get to number six. It's going to talk about the mark of the beast. But I will help you if you just out from point six, so you won't you won't get upset with me. Just put Revelation thirteen of under point six. You know, this thirteenth chapter of Revelation. You got that? And put Acts seventeen twenty nine. Out from point number six, which is separating from Ishmael, put Revelation thirteen. That's the whole chapter. And I want to tell you, he's faithful. And if you won't despise a day of small things, he will bring you into covenantal abundance. So what I'd like to do is, is, is finish my story and then give you these points. Which I can give you these points in 20 minutes. But you have to know the backdrop of where I heard this message for it to be effective. I don't want to be lengthy. I think I can do this in an hour. And on purpose this morning, I wanted to keep this light because you've been stretched enough. Okay? Although there is a homework assignment for this evening. We'll provide himself. God will provide himself. The ram of substitution. The ram caught in the thicket. Jesus caught in this sin-cursed world. Is this too big a picture? The Father and the Son. Only the Father and Son go up the mountain. Serpent's face is above To Revelation of worship, verse 5. We go up, we go yonder to worship. Worship is sacrifice. I'll get you to the final one is from Isaac. And that's Genesis 22. Now you'll want to pick up your Bibles and your notebooks when you get to number 6. It's going to talk about the mark of the beast. But I will help you if you're just out from point 6. So you won't, you won't get upset with me. Just put Revelation 13, or under point 6, you know, this 13th chapter of Revelation. You got that? And put Acts 17, 29. Out from point number 6, which is separating from Ishmael, put Revelation 13, that's the whole chapter, and Acts 17, 29. You could also put 1 John 4, 1 to 3. 1 John 4, 1 to 3. Now that's your notes. Are you finished your notes now? Just put a few words. All right. From <laughs> money is not evil. There is no bad money on the planet and in finance. I want to tell you he's faithful. And if
if you won't from a desire to get well. Put out from there Genesis 14. Genesis 14. Number six, and you will, you will get upset with me because I'm going to have you put your notebooks and Bibles away. But number six is from Ishmael. I-S-H-M-A-E-L. Ishmael. And that's Genesis 16 and 21. Genesis 16 and 21. Or you could just say 16 to 21, but just rather 16 and 21. And the last separation, the final one, is from Isaac. And that's Genesis 22. Now you'll want to pick up your Bibles and your notebooks when I get to number 6. It's going to talk about the mark of the beast. But I will help you if you're just out from point 6 so you won't, you won't get upset with me. Just put Revelation 13 uh, under point 6. And you just 13th chapter of Revelation. You got that? And put Acts 17, 29. Out from point number 6, which is separating from Ishmael, put Revelation 13, that's the whole chapter, and Acts 17, 29. You could also put 1 John 4, 1 to 3. 1 John 4, 1 to 3. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. Bibles away. I mean away. Not on the floor where you can see them. I want your undivided attention. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. I can see the problem you have with these Kiwi women here. All right. <clears throat> All right. Now, what I want to do, and I don't like what the Lord wants me to do. I don't like to talk about myself. And ordinarily, I don't even like to tell people what the Lord's done for my church or my family. Because if they don't know me by the Spirit, they'll misjudge me. My motive is pure. Knowing my beginnings in God and in finance, I want to tell you he's faithful. And if you won't despise a day of small things, he will bring you into covenantal abundance. So what I'd like to do is, is, is finish my story and then give you these points, which I can give you these points in 20 minutes. But you have to know the backdrop of where I heard this message for it to be effective. I don't want to be lengthy. I think I can do this in an hour. And on purpose this morning, I wanted to keep this light because you've been stretched enough. Okay? Although there is a homework assignment for this evening, which you can remember. And if you don't do this homework, God will never speak to you again. No. Read the first two chapters of Matthew and the first two chapters of Luke. You can remember that. What did I ask you to do? First two chapters of Matthew and the first two chapters of Luke. You don't have to read the begatitudes in Matthew 1. Start with verse 18. This verse is 18 to 25. Maybe verse 1. But you don't have to read through all those names. That's Matthew 1. I want you to read Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2. Why? That's our text for this evening. Okay? <clears throat> Thank you. Now, oh, I don't want to do this. We were at the Bible school. My wife and I married for five of the seven years I was there. I could tell you other stories, but you've gotten the flavor of it. I'm not saying this to boast. I'm not just saying it to, to flap my gums. I'm saying it to make a point. And it was in the prime of my life, between the ages of 21 and 27, I spent the prime of my life, ages 21 to 27, at Zion School of Christian Education. The average class size was four. It 
in that seven year stint I had people and preachers because I'd begun to write come by and tell me I was out of my mind what are you doing wasting your time in this hole in the ground and I was so content in the will of God I looked at them and said I don't know what you're talking about remember when Elijah went up and his mantle came down that mantles the will of God and I challenge you, there it lay, pick it up. Somebody pick it up. I went into a youth meeting one night, took my coat off, said, anybody want my mantle? And threw it on the floor. They about ripped my jacket up. And when it was done, there were young people laying all over the floor. <clears throat> Elijah's mantle is the will of God. And there's three things about it. One, it was rough. Two, it was heavy. Three, it'll keep you warm. And so you want to take notes. Nope. Listen. It's rough. Tell your neighbor, it's not easy. It's heavy. It's heavy responsibility. But it'll keep you warm. You'll be safer in the will of God in a dangerous situation than you would be otherwise. Isn't that neat? <clears throat> so men would come by and say, why are you doing this? And again, the Bible school began in that old Shaw mansion. It moved down to Principal McDowell's double-wide home with the little trailer by the side that the old man and the dog died in. Remember that? Then up on the mountain, and all there was on that farm that we bought, was an old farmhouse and the McDowell's lived in that and we had the school in that we had the classrooms in that we had the meals in that and me and my wife bought that 12 by 64 mobile home at $98.03 a month and my salary for those seven years was $10 a week or $520 a year. I spent more than that on souvenirs the other day, which were gifts for my staff and my wife and my children. I spent 80 bucks U.S. on something for me. Oh, how nice. And the women want to know what it is. I went into a map shop and a beautiful frame map of James, was it James Brooks? Cook, James Cook. And it was, it was a 19th century map of your nation. Gorgeous. It's going in my new office in my new sanctuary. Lovely. I was looking for a wood carving of your, of your nation, but I couldn't find one. When I went to South Africa, and a big circular piece of wood, gorgeous, are the big five, the animals, the lion, the elephant, and the whatnot. Anyway. So what I made in a year in those days, I spent more than that on souvenirs this week in about an hour and a half. Because I've got my wife and both of my daughters some lovely jewelry. Everybody say sugar. That's right, good sugar. Mm -hmm. It's been nice, Mama, but I'm going home to my mama. All right? <clears throat> Hallelujah. <laughs> if I said that, they'll run me out of town on a rail, Lord. Oh, I'll say it. It's the last day. Just because there's snow on the mountain, don't think there isn't fire in the furnace. The name of this class today is Reality 101, <laughs> or Bonehead Kingdom, whichever you want to. <laughs> Can you believe I said that? <laughs> it's videoed. It's going to the nation. That's all right. So I didn't tell you that's, you know, that's my sob story. Those days were glorious. 
There were times a revival would hit that school and we did nothing but just come into the presence of God two or three weeks at a time. Same thing. Why, sir, it's amazing to me the parallels between your life and mine. Even our present location, we're 20 minutes out, you know, outside of town and all that stuff. Anyway. In the spring of 1977, I took a trip with Catherine and C.S. Fowler, good friends, one of the pastors that mentored me. He was what I call a badger skin preacher, like the, the seal skin or the badger skins on the exterior of the tabernacle. Tell your neighbor he was rough. <laughs> but he taught me faith. He did. I remember I had the faith to, to reach out and believe God for $325 to buy an Olivetti Editor C3 typewriter with a carbon ribbon. It was 30 times what I made in a week. But he taught me faith. And the writing ministry began to blossom, and he helped me begin to do that. And we started sending notes out to places, and I worked with him. And he had a vision for missions in Mexico, and so my wife and I went with him that summer. We'd never been anywhere. And getting out and away from things, sometimes God can show you a bigger world and a bigger picture. And I was frustrated because after having memorized the shoebox full of tapes, I had a vision for a local church, and I had a vision to go and plant a work for God. And it was that summer in Mexico when the Lord spoke to me. And he says, it's time to leave the school. I said, where am I going? He said, I'll let you know. That's fun. And like my daddy Abraham, I went out not knowing whether I went. And we moved our mobile home down off the mountain because I didn't want it up there in the middle of winter because at Grantsville it starts to snow in Thanksgiving. You don't see the ground till May. So we moved our mobile home down to the bottom of the mountain, a little town called Cressop Town, Maryland. Never moved in it, never lived in it. Ended up selling it to a, a man whose daughter was in college. And I remember when we left the school, I was so scared. We were so scared. I didn't know what to do. The $10 a week security I'd known for seven years, I didn't even have that. We had nothing. And so Benny Simmons, my good buddy down at Roarsville, Maryland, down toward Washington, D.C., who was pastor down there, I went down to see Benny, and he saved my life, and for three days and nights we only did two things. We played ferocious ping pong. Don't even think about it. I can slam with both hands. I'd frustrate you. You can't touch me. And on a billiards table, I could sit in a chair and beat you. Don't even think about it. Because <laughs> in my home right now is the altar which we all worship. One inch of Italian slate, oak and leather pockets. And yes, I do know how to play billiards. Pocket billiards and the real game, snooker on a 12-foot table. Don't even think about it. That's how I torment preachers. When we were building my home, Good old boy came in. He said, you like to shoot? I said, oh, a little bit. He said, tell you what, we'll shoot eight games of, uh, ten games of eight ball. You beat me. You know, I want to tell you what I told him. I said, if I beat you, he was my, he was my craftsman doing all my inside uh, woodwork. I said, I don't have to pay you. And I ran a few racks on him, and he just said, you're no preacher. <laughs> Next day, he brings a buddy with him, had one of these hats on, comes right to my door. Didn't even say hello. He said, let's shoot. And uh, I heard him, too. And he said, you can't be a preacher. Well, anyway. Hmm. Don't think about it. Don't even think about it. So Benny Simmons and I, I mean, morning and night, three days and three nights. He's a guy about my size. Can you imagine this? The women just left us alone. We were playing 10 to 15 feet back off the table, both ends. I mean, we were screaming, yelling, tearing the furniture apart. And he knew I was coming, so he, he took some RC cola liters the, 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 and made 30 liters <laughs> of homemade root beer. <laughs> I mean, with yeast and extract and the whole thing. Let it fizz real good. 
And he said, come here when he walked in the door, and he took me into his, his bathroom, and there it lay in the bathtub, 30 liters of RC. We knocked that down, and, and his wife, Carolyn, could make the best homemade pizza. So homemade pizza, homemade root beer, and ferocious ping pong for three days and three nights. Saved my life. Why? I was scared. You don't ever get scared? Hmm. He said, let's go down to Asheville, North Carolina. I said, what's happening? He says, well, there's a Labor Day convention down there. This is the fall of 77. He said, Apostle G.C. McCurry from Athens, Georgia is down there. Let's go hear him preach. I said, okay. Because you see, the, the big hairy hand that went on my head was attached to that man's arm. Okay. So we went. And G.C. McCurry preached the message called The Seven Separations of Abraham. And at that time in my life, it saved my life. So everywhere, anytime, because it, just, it so imprinted my spirit, anytime I just breathe the words out, people get healed and saved and delivered and understanding. And We'll go there in just a second. Later that month, in September the 25th of 1977, Pastor Woodby invited me back down to his church to do a convention, which I did for him. And it was there that I got a phone call from Pastor Fowler up in West Virginia. He said, listen, as long as you're in North Carolina, Asheville's on the west side in the mountains, Richland's on the east side near the beaches, he said, I, I, there, there's a charismatic group of folks that just a bunch of them got saved and filled the Holy Ghost and come out of the Methodist Church are praying for a pastor. Why don't you go over and see him? I'll meet you there. End of the month. October. I said, okay. So we went to Richlands, North Carolina. First time. I can't tell you all that happened. We met these wonderful people. Hungry people. And went back up to Maryland, and they asked me to come back down in November of 77. Second visit. My wife was with me. And it was at that time the Lord spoke to us and said, this is where I want you to be. I can't go into all the particulars of that. We went home, told our family. They thought we were crazy because we were going to move 500 miles away from everything and everyone we ever knew. South. Things went quickly. We had the mobile home to sell, put it up for sale, took a loss on it, because I had to get out of Dodge. I sold it with the, with the understanding after, after the first of the year, it's your baby, I don't want to deal with it, I'm out of here. You don't worry about things like that when you're following God. Now, you're not stupid, you're not foolish. I took a $200 loss. It wasn't like we lost everything, but I gave him a good deal he couldn't turn down. With the understanding, he take care of it because it was already, you know, set up and all that stuff. New Year's Eve, 77, went to Brother McCurry's church to preach, Athens, Georgia. New Year's Eve service. That big old hand went on my head again. The word of the Lord came and said, I send you. You will build three tabernacles for my name. Each time I will fill it with my glory and my people, and then I will give you further instruction. To put that word in perspective, we've built twice. That was 23 years ago. We're getting ready to build the third time, and the devil is scared, terrified, senseless, considering what the further instruction means because it has to do with the nations. We went there, landed in January, incorporated the work, contractually legalized it February, bought the four acres we have now in April, went on the radio at the same time, bought a new home, a double-wide mobile home, twice the size of the one we had in Maryland. Well, we're on our way now. Moved it on the property in May, broke ground for our first building in June, was in in October, that quick. I mean, God moved. That was 78. 
Rich lands is 1,000 to 1,200 people. But because of the radio ministry, the church began to grow. Make a long story short, because I've got to I've got to get the highlights. Through the eighties, we began to grow. In the mid eighties, we were up to two hundred and fifty people. We were moving out eight thousand cassette tapes a month. Had a staff of fifteen full time paid, seventy five kids in our Christian school, and a monthly budget of thirty six thousand dollars. I had met Bill Britton in March, but I'd met him in 80, preached his convention in March of 81 and October of 81, where I preached the more excellent ministry. And after those two meetings, our mailing list went from 1,000 to 3,000 people. There's now 11,000 on it. But in the mid-80s, God blew on the work. He had to. Two reasons. Because with every vision, you have to go through death and burial and resurrection. And burial is worse than death because in burial, nobody touches you, nobody phones you. You just lay there and die. Burial is worse than death. God blew on the work for two reasons. One, superficiality of relationships in our midst. We weren't real. We were a company of prophets, not sons of the prophets. We weren't real. Two, the idolatry in our midst. In one stint, I saw 55 people move from nine states in six months. One reason, just to come and hear me teach the word. And so to smash their idol, God let all you know what break loose. And I could do nothing right for about three years. Just ask anybody. God had to smash their idol. Now that wasn't fun. I'm not talking about the saints alone. I'm talking about elders, deacons. I do not want to go back to those days. Although what I had experienced at the seven years at the Bible school up in Maryland was much harder than anything I had experienced in rich lands. So I was ready for it. God's biddings are his enablings. Whom he calls, he equips. And so God blew on the work and everything was cut but two-thirds. I started praying, Lord, if... They don't love me, don't love you, don't love what this place is about. I don't want them here. My wife said, stop praying. When it went from 250 to over 250 to under 100, she said, stop praying. When the budget went from 36 to 12,000, stop praying. When the school went from 75 to 25, stop praying. When 15 paid staff went to 5, stop praying. I'd gone to Guyana and to Brazil, got back, contracted bronchitis on my back for three days and three nights. That's rare for me. Went into my administrator and said, Preacher, we got us a problem. There's $25,000 worth of unpaid bills on our desk. I said, How come? He said, Well, we sent out tapes and books to preachers all over the world, and they said they'd send an offering, and they haven't. I went through every one of those orders myself, got hot under the collar, got in the flesh, Drafted a letter, I know how to write. And, oh, it was slick. I said, the kingdom of God is, first of all, righteousness. Now, you guys need to do what's right. Man, I let them have it. Got up in church that Sunday morning, read the letter, and the people went, yes! And on Monday, one young prophet in the midst that had more courage than my elders said, Pastor Varner, need to see you. I said, what is it, son? He said, uh, that letter you're about to send, the Holy Ghost says, don't send the letter of dispute. Oh, I wanted to slap him across the room. <laughs> but I was afraid God would hurt me because he was right. So I got up the next Sunday morning, cried like a baby, repented, 
and said, we're not going to send the letter. And the people said, yes. <laughs> people aren't your source. So we didn't send the letter. And in six weeks, God supernaturally sent us $40,000. We're still a small church. And ever since we entertained the thought of building a third time, we're getting smaller. All you know what's broken loose on us this year. I could tell you more stories. My salary when I first went to Richlands was $200 a week. Through the 80s, it was $400 a week. And in that stint of being really tried in the mid-80s, they came to me week after week and said, do we pay you or keep the lights on? I said, keep the lights on until 40 checks were laying in my desk, $10,000 worth of back salary. And God spoke to me one morning. He said, you're killing this thing. If these people don't do what's right and support you, I can't bless it. So I took that to the house. They agreed with me. They paid me back, and God started blessing there's 150 people in my church. Our budget for 98 and 99 was over half a million dollars. Ninety percent tithe in our church. I'm ashamed to tell you that because 10 percent of my people are thieves. They're cursed with a curse and they've got a bag with holes in it. They're sinners. Just like some of you are. Look at me. Get the meanest look on your face you can get and shoot it up here. Just snoot me real good. See if it, see if it bothers me. There's sinners in this room. Blatant, arrogant sinners. How dare you? Well, how dare you? You're going to the nations with the word of liberty creation. And Jesus said, if you cannot do that which is least, why take you thought for the rest? This is elementary, my dear sir, tithing. It's elementary, basic. You can't do that. You're a disgrace to the ministry. Get out now. You embarrass the rest of us. How many still love Pastor Varner? Well, you don't know what we have to go through here. You, you, you just don't know. Hey! Hey! Yes, I do. But what would you do all those years when you got $10 a week? I tithed and offered. What have you done for 35 years? I tithed and offered. When you tithe, you give God nothing. Your giving should start at 15% and go from there. Minimum. Well, I can't afford it. It's not quiet, is it? Or whether you love me or you don't, I'm still right. You know why I'm right? It's the word. I didn't write it. I'm just commissioned to proclaim it. What are you commissioned to do? You're going to give it and you don't even obey it? Jesus said, look it up. You look it up. I'm not intending to tell him where, it, where it's found, this one. He said, if you cannot do that which is least, what's that? Put a smile on your face, come to church on time, tithe and offer, witness. If you can't do the basics, pray. If you cannot do that which is least, why take you thought for the rest? You can't be nice to people. Now, you think I'm letting up off of this thing. No, I'm bearing down on it. I may never see you again. You may never see me again. You may never see each other again. You don't know what a day will bring forth. And that's not that old order, you know, you might drop dead, your car might hit you, you know, go to hell, Mr. Rapture, and all that stuff. Ah, oh, go on with yourself. That's not preaching, that's junk. But nobody knows what a day will bring forth. And I do love you. 
I want to see every one of you blessed. God can't bless you if you're not faithful with your money. You know why? Your money's your life. It is you. And you give little because you think you are little. And that is the besetting sin of your nation. That is the word of the Lord, as, as clearly as I can articulate it. People in this nation struggle with money. They give little because they think they are little. Outer court, it's what you give. Holy place, how you give. Most holy place, you are the gift. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. With some people, their neighbor don't have a chance. And the reason why many of us, even in this room, are not blessed financially is because of your mindset, the self-imagery you have concerning yourself. I'm telling you, and I'm right, you are the best. You're to have the best. Come on, somebody. That's weak. I said you are the best, and you're to have the best. And everything you do is with a spirit of excellence. Well, you don't know the country I'm sent to. All the more reason. And I'm a bad dream to most preachers. You know why? If you can do it in rich lands, you can do it anywhere. Why don't you go to some big city so you can have a worldwide vision? I got one where I'm at. We struggled in the 80s. But beginning with the 90s, God prospered and turned it. My salary through the 90s was 600 a week, and just this year they gave me $1,000 a week. Now, before you think that's too much money, let me tell you what I've done for 23 years at Richlands. I've written now, with this book I'm writing here, 13 books for Destiny Image. You hearing me? I don't put that burden on my people. Joanne and I pay for that. Who's right it is? Cost me $25,000. First printing. Out of my pocket. Corporate anointing, 20. For 5,000 copies. It's expensive. I do not put that burden on my church because my faith is developed. Some of you looking there with your eyes shut. Look at me. Look at me. Thank you. Don't close your eyes and hide from me. Right here. I refuse, Des, to put that burden on my people. Their, face, their faith is not developed like mine is. That would be unrighteous. One of the, one of the, 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 one of the most ignorant things I've done as a pastor is to put the same level of commitment on my people that God puts on me. That's wrong. That's wrong. You know why? Because they don't have the grace to be radical like I've got to be. As a leader, a pastor, teacher, evangelist, missionary, whatever you're going to call yourself, God's going to show it to you quick. He's going to show it to you first. Your people aren't going to get it that quick. And it's wrong. I've done it. Don't do what I did. It's wrong to put the same level of commitment on your people that God expects of you. That's like you as a parent expecting some little kid like this beautiful little thing just walked in. How old are you, sweetheart? Eight. You have the most beautiful eyes, I say. Mm -hmm. You can't expect an eight-year-old baby like this to be as responsible. Come on. My son's John. He's 19. Now, if I was in America, I'd give a real funny, because some of you need it right now. I'd, need a, I'd give a real funny, you know, it's a joke. Dr. Patterson. There's a store in America called Toys R Us. And you'd have to know how southern people speak in my land. Because in the south, it's not Toys R Us. It's called We Be Toys. But that's how southerners talk. See, that doesn't mean a thing to you. But in America, they'd be rolling on the floor when I said that. See what I mean? Just have to find another way of saying it. <laughs> then, I, then I jump into this illustration. My David is 13. My Jonathan is 19. This is a deep revelation. As David was growing up, my wife would come to me and say, Sweetheart, he's only four. He's only seven. He's only nine. When I get home, she'll say, Honey, he's only 13. This is deep. 
Guess why he acted like he was for? He be for. See how the application goes? He, he is for at that time. He did a dumb thing while I was gone. Why? He's 13. That's too deep for some of you. Jonathan's 19. David's 13. I deal with them differently. You understand me? Okay. The language barrier. And God has blessed, but it hasn't been easy there. But beginning in the 90s, he began to bless. So those books, okay, and, and, and all, all those raises, I didn't want them. I said, give them somebody else. God takes care of me. But God had to knock me in the head and say, if you don't allow God's people to bless you, I can't bless them. Now, I'm going to sound like one of the faith boys now. I'm going to sound like one of these health and prosperity kicks, you know. But it's true. It's true. If I had a room full of faith preachers, I, I would really blow their minds. I'd tell them what they think is meat as the faith message is milk. It's Hebrews 11 faith, which is Old Testament faith. You can do five just awesome things with that faith. One, born again, justified by faith. Heart circumcised and water baptism by faith. Hmm? Filled with the Holy Ghost by faith. Okay? Your body healed by faith. Or if you need it, demon cast out. And five, you'll pay your bills. Faith will do those five things. That's elementary faith. That's faith toward God. First principles, faith. With that kind of faith, you can do two glorious things. Die and die without the promise. Your faith is not in Hebrews 11. It's in Hebrews 12, where Jesus is the author and the finisher of your faith. Hebrews 11 faith, which is basic faith, which is a faith message that came out of America, is not meat. It's milk. Milk. I'm not putting it down. All you need to be saved, baptized in water, filled with the Holy Ghost, healed, and know that God will pay your finances. I, I'm telling you, you need to know that. But Hebrews 11 faith is man's faith in God. Hebrews 12 faith is God's faith in himself in and through man. There's a tremendous seminar I just gave you. The all faith of 1 Corinthians 13, that's Jesus' faith. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Have the faith of God. I know it says have faith in God, but literally have the faith of God. Back to my story. People say, my goodness, a half a million dollars the last two years? Yep. Wasn't always that way. It's just turned in the last five years, really, Des. And reading your story has happened here, too. God's beginning to really turn things for you. Stay with me. So, all the DI books that I, I brought to you, they weren't from my church. They're from me. Me and my wife paid for those. They cost me four bucks a piece. Me, really five with, with postage. They'd retail for more than that, but there it is. I sent over a thousand copies of Corporate Anointing to South Africa. When preachers come to see me, they go out with an armload of books under them. All of them. If you came to visit me, you'd be blessed. I'd see to it. I've done that for years. Then of all the books that we print there at home in our print shop, there's 40 more titles. Books of the Bible from Genesis to Ezekiel, the Tabernacle Notes, Sermon on the Mount Notes, all kinds of booklets. And all of the revenue that comes in for that, I don't want a penny of it. I don't see a penny of it. All the tapes. I have preached almost 2,000 messages since I've been there. All of that revenue that comes into our church, it goes into the house of the Lord. I preach them. They're my tapes and my books, my stuff. And of the half a million dollars that comes into our church the last two years, half of it's from the outside for those books. And half of it's the tithes and offerings of 150 people. And this year, if it goes on track, it'll be $600,000 comes in our church. Now, there's one or two in the room that's in the flesh and not the spirit. You think I'm just shooting numbers at you. No. 
That's why I even hesitate telling you about personal blessings. See what kind of house you live in. 3,700 square feet. I pay $1,100 a month. House payment. 900 bucks on a house. $200 on insurance and taxes. I pay that myself. Why would you build such a nice house? Because my family has to share me with the world and I wanted each of my kids to have their own room. There are four full baths in my house because I knew two teenage girls were coming up and I want my own bathroom. <laughs> it's a nice house. And they curse me when I build it. Who did? Jealous people who didn't know me. It's a long way, baby, from an old trailer that an old man and an old dog died in. It's not fancy. It's just nice. When we got ready to furnish that house, a man from Ohio who owns a furniture store let me furnish the entire house at cost and then gave me a leather sofa just to bless me. My wife, who had shared her kitchen for years with everybody, a businessman came to her and he said, go to the furniture store. We went, we went down to Wilmington one afternoon, just crazy. We were out of money, didn't have any money. Building this house, don't know how to pay for it, don't know how to, it's, it's crazy. It was, a, it was a journey. And I said, let's go to Wilmington, pick out all your, let's go pick out your kitchen. You just get whatever you want. And we, we just went silly one afternoon. I haven't forgotten the seven separations, so chill out, okay? I'm after something. And we went down there, and I said, I know what I want. I want a 25 cubic foot, a man refrigerator with ice in the front and all the little doohickeys. I want that. She said, well, I know what I want. I want a Gen Air stove that you can cook on and all the bells and whistles. And we just picked out all the expensive stuff. And the guy said, you, you know, you want this gift wrapped or sent? Uh, we, we were just looking around. A week later, a businessman called to her, said, Mrs. Varner, God spoke to me. Go pick out whatever you want for your kitchen. I'll pay for it and deliver it. The only thing that cost me 18 bucks to ship the refrigerator. <laughs> Could I tell you stories? You like that ring? It's a gift. You like that ring? It's a gift. You like that ring? It's a gift. You like that tie tack? That's a diamond. It's a gift. I've got an anointing of people giving me stuff. How'd you get it? Tied in office for 35 years. How'd you get, how'd you get your people to give 90% tithe? I'm a good example. I don't even want to talk about the conference center and sanctuary we're about to build. $1.8 million, 27,000 square feet, and I don't even need the building. I must be nuts. I could put my congregation in the balcony. I've got a slogan up in front of my sanctuary, build it and they will come. Because they ain't there now. <laughs> yeah, you can laugh. The first building we built cost us $110,000, and we borrowed a note, $90,000 note, and took us seven years to pay that thing off. When God said build this building, in the first three months we were given $90,000. I want to prophesy, and I know you're tired and yawning and half of you sleep, but I'm just going to sit here and enjoy myself right now. Hallelujah. When I think of the goodness of the Lord, oh, my God, and the faithfulness of God. Don't clap. You're into my time. Don't clap. Oh, hallelujah. When I think about how good God's been, wow, wow. Say, so what kind of vehicle do you drive? A big conversion van's got everything in it but a bathroom. TV, VCR, Nintendo. The church bought this one for me. They were nice. They didn't have to buy the first three. They were gifts. Gifts. And when they get eighty or 90,000 miles on them, the same man would come back and say, isn't it about time you trade it in? I said, well, whatever. He said, let's go. 
He'd take the one, the old one, go in, fix it all up, let the guy sell it, gave me the money for what it got, and then gave me another one. Now see, if you hear me talk like this and don't know me or where I came from, somebody, I promise you, let me do this disclaimer, if you're seeing this video or hearing this audio tape, apart from everything I've said to these people for, for 10 days and apart from what I said in the beginning this morning, you are going to misjudge me. You think that arrogant, brash, who does he think is man? Stupid American. Don't know me. But I don't feel like I'm casting my pearls before swine or taking that which is holy and giving it to dogs because you don't look to me like swine or dogs. You look like my family to me. Is this okay? Des is your papa. I'm one of your uncles. That's the word of the Lord. I'm not kidding. I feel like family here. Is this okay? That's pop. That's mom. I want to be an uncle or a brother. If that bothers you, just let me be a servant. I can help you. Des, it's been very difficult. I still struggle. And what I struggle with, sir, is knowing who I am in Christ and what is in me. And people don't know about it or don't want it. That's why this visit has meant so much to me. Because you do seem to have appreciated what God's put in me. I love you. The latest blessing was the, the, the deacon that's much better. Talked to my wife yesterday. He's walking the halls. He's eating. He's up and about. And, oh, the, the mass in his thyroid that they thought was cancer, they did a test and can't even find the mass. Hey! Mom and I were in a deacon's meeting one Tuesday night, and this family needed a vehicle. God spoke to me during the deacon's meeting. He said, give the Cadillac to them. It's an 89 Caddy. It was nice shape. Silver. Pretty car. Ooh. We only paid 5000 bucks for it. We stole it. It's that Jew in me. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. That was me and not the Lord. Okay. Didn't even say that by permission. That would just flesh. Anyhow, because there might be a good Jewish friend listening in. I just lost him. All right, listen up. And, and God said, give the caddy to the wards. Well, I'm not going to touch that. That's mama's car. Went home, kept my mouth shut. Smart husband. She said, honey, can we talk? I said, sure, baby. She said, God spoke to me tonight in church. I said, what did he say, honey? She said, well, this is most unusual, and I don't want you to be upset, but we're supposed to give the Cadillac to the wards. I said, I know. That was Tuesday night. We went out the next day, cleaned it up, put gas in it, full tank. Went to church the next night and gave it to them. Thursday morning, the very next day, I get a phone call. Pastor Varner, yes. My husband just died. I'm sorry. Well, the family's been in prayer, and we'd like you to have his car. I thought, well, okay. I said, what is it? She says, it's a 1998 Lincoln Town car with 12,000 miles on it. It might not be the color you like. I said, I'm sure we can manage. <laughs> that happened three months ago. I didn't tell you all the stories. And I'm not going to be able to tell you about the mark of the beast. Don't even want to. No. Fifteen minutes of seven separations and I'm out of here. It's easy. Every time the old man Abraham made a separation, God spoke to him, revelation, and he went and built an altar, worship. Every time. You've already got the scriptures. You're not taking notes. You're just listening. The first separation is from Kindred. Get thee out of thy, pardon me, country. Get thee out of thy country. A country has boundary lines. 
limitations. Your first separation says, God, I will put no boundary lines. I will put no limitations on you. Make it plain. I will not let anything keep me back from God. You get that attitude, your family will go nuts. So then you take your second separation from kindred. So after two separations, I will not let anything or anyone keep me back from God. He didn't listen. He brought Tira, his father, and there's a message when the old man died. It's a terrible language because your father and your mother is not the old man, the old woman, but it's a play on words. When the old man died, he came on into the land. And he did bring Lot, his nephew, who was a monkey on his back. He learned the hard way. But he separated from country and kindred. Abraham was not a Jew. He was a moon worshiper from Ur of the Chaldees. That'll flip him out when you tell him that. He wasn't a Jew. He's an idolater. God said, get out. Leave your country and your kindred. I'll show you the land. Make your name great. Make you a blessing. Bless all the families of the earth. Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3. Third separation was from Egypt. God interceded for a liar. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's hope for us. <laughs> God interceded for a liar. He went down to Egypt. You know the story. Lied about his wife. God interceded for, you know, for that liar. But he got him something in Egypt he shouldn't have got. He got Hagar. But finally he did separate from Egypt. What is Egypt? Egypt is the world. 1 John 2, 15, 16, 17. All that is in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the third separation. What are those? The lust of the flesh. Command these stones to be made bread. Three temptations. You can parallel the three temptations of Jesus with, with three things in Job and uh, some other stuff. I'm not getting into all that. Anyhow, and with the temptation of the woman in the garden. That was the other one. I, 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 you know, I'm not getting into all that. The first temptation, the first test, lust of, you know, lust of the flesh, that's where you take the anointing and use it for your own gain. Lust of the eyes, love of money. Take the anointing, make a buck with it. Pride of life, take the anointing, become somebody's favorite preacher. Popularity. He separated from all that. What was the first separation? Country. Second, kindred. Thirdly, Egypt. Fourthly, Lot. That's the monkey on your back. That's the carnal Christian. Those are those relationships, excuse my language, it's rather crude, that just suck the life out of you. It's a monkey on your back, Abraham. It's people that aren't interested at all in serving God. They just want to suck you bone dry. And eventually, you have to separate from those people. And when they did, you remember the story. Abraham said, I'll give you the best property. What do you want, son? And he looked down there at the plain where Sodom was. Listen to me. And the reason Lot went to Sodom, he found the closest thing that looked like Babylon because he never left it. And if I had a room full of preachers, I'd tell you this. He went down there and they made him an elder in that church. He became an elder in that homosexual church. Sodomy. Is this okay? He separated from Lot. Those are those relationships in your life that Jesus did not arrange. You did that out of human sympathy and or ignorance. And those people will hurt you. If I had a room full of theologians, I would divulge the principle of horizontal mediation. What's horizontal mediation? The misquote of 1 Timothy 2, 5. There's one mediator between God and men. Get it right. He is the only one mediator between God and man vertically. But there it says God and men horizontal. What's that mean? If Jesus Christ does not mediate, oversee, govern, have jurisdiction over the human relationships in your life, you'll marry the wrong person, have the wrong friends, and run with losers. Run with yes people. You'll never get around anybody that will stimulate you, provoke you, or correct you. 
birds of a feather. Us four no more. We're comfortable. We're Kiwis. We're proud people. We're poor and we think it's spiritual. We'll always be poor because we don't tithe. Too rough? Hello, Abraham. That's weak as whatever. Hello, Abraham. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Ruth. Hello. Well, something stuck. But I want to tell you something. Thieves and robbers and people who don't tithe are not something worth seeing. They're something worth avoiding and judging. <coughs> Back at the Bible school, I have milked a cow, I'll have you know. Oh, I'm impressed. I have baled hay. I've done that thing, man. I've even slopped pigs, but I'm not going to do that with your congregation. Now, just leave me alone. I'll just go so far. I'm going to go see your congregation today. He, that, and he's going to, I'm going to walk around, film everything. Anyway, we had an old truck on the farm back there at the Bible school. And it had a low gear called Grandma. Excuse me, I should not use that term. I can tell I'm in trouble. But when she really needed to pull a load, we'd sock that thing on down. <coughs> and she'd go, mm -hmm. Turn to your neighbor and say, he just kicked into Grandma. <laughs> separated, listen, 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 listen. He separated from what? Country, kindred, lot. Egypt, Lot, fifth, a desire to get well. Being a good pastor, Abraham took 318 of his own servants, which he trained up in his own house, sons of the house, went out and beat up five armies. And the king of Sodom was so grateful, he said, let me bless you. Abraham said, no way. If you bless me, you buy me. I don't belong to anybody. And so he separated right then and there from a desire to get well. He didn't separate from wealth. Or God's plan to make him wealthy. He separated from the love of money. Can't be bought. Most preachers in America can be bought. I can't be bought. I've lived by faith for 35 years. And right now I'm building this new conference center. This new building. It's for the nations. Don't have the money. Don't have the people. Just a word from God. I must be nuts. Must be so nuts, it's working because it's October now, isn't it? In two years, over top of the half million, God has given us $300,000 for the building in two years. One large gift of 30000 from a preacher I don't even know, and none other preacher had a building fund. God told him to empty it and give it to us 20000 It's been interesting. Totally supernatural. And you know what's wild, Des? There was a day when $100 was a mountain. I don't even think about $100. I only think about $1,000. And giving, I don't even think about it. I brought over $1,000 worth of books, didn't even think about it. I'm after something. I'm after something. And now I'm thinking in terms of $1.8 million. And you know the craziest thing? You won't believe this. I'm not worried about the building, and I'm not even excited about it. You might think me mad. You'd laugh if you'd see the little cubby hole of an office that I have. I've got a real nice office at home. That's where I do my writing and all my work. But my wife got so mad, so I took a couple thousand volumes of my books out of the house and put them at the church. Because we have books everywhere. I mean, in every room. Gee whiz. I bought some books. Cubby hole, just a little cubby hole of an office. I don't even have a real office at the church. Got me a nice one in that new building. Got me a map of New Zealand's going to go on the wall. I'm gathering stuff right now for my new office that I don't have because God does not give you an empty freezer. <laughs> you got to hear that. I've, I've, I've exercised my faith, bro. I've, I've developed my muscle. I believe God. 
It's maddening what we're about. And don't tell my people because I've got them talked into it. Don't tell them it's crazy. Please, don't, don't breathe. Don't, don't tell them. We're out here walking on this water together. Shh, 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 shh. But I remember $10 a week. And I remember the bucket of potatoes. And I remember laying hands on an empty gas tank. And I remember firing a furnace. And I remember a classroom with one student. Linda Bose did. Save his grace and mercy. So Abraham was separated from a desire to get wealth. If I taught you about the mark of the beast, which I don't have time, it's present reality. The old man Adam is a beast. Therion, wild beast, Revelation 13. The mark was in the forehead and right hand. The Greek word for mark, if I were to teach you on the mark of the beast, the Greek word for mark is karagma, English transliterated character. Beastly character. In the forehead, human wisdom. Hand, human strength. The sixth separation from Ishmael. Ishmael's a good idea. He's an antichrist. He persecutes the son of promise. He's a product of Sarah's head, good idea, and Abraham's loins. She said, oh, man, you go in here and get her pregnant. We'll know it's God. God worked a miracle so Abraham could work the works of the flesh. Ishmael's born. Abraham's strutting around the camp like a banny rooster. Is that New Zealand? Okay. And he's proud. Yeah, you're, you're proud, old boy. It looks like you, but it has an Egyptian heart like its mama. And Egyptians, read your Bible. Shepherds are an abomination to Egyptians. Oh, there's too much to tell. Too much to tell. And so the day comes when you have to cast it out and what produced it. There's the allegory, Galatians 4. Make it simple. What's the mark of the beast? That's when you take matters into your own hands to fulfill the promise of God, using your wisdom, not his, and using your strength, not his. Anything. The whole, you know what the irony is? Schofield's whole demonic system that says you won't ever have to take the mark of the beast, it's already marked. The whole system's marked. It's imprinted, stamped upon. That, that, word, that word mark means a, a stamp or an impress. The whole human wisdom, and that's America. That's American church. It's run like Madison Avenue, think tanks. You don't even need the Holy Ghost. It's a business. So smart men, you know, Sit around and get these good ideas. The last thing you need, man of God, is a good idea. Then you put your money, your technology behind it. When Paul went to Athens, he watched all the idolatry. Watch me. I'm into the man in the mirror. I'm into the man in the mirror. And the word of the Lord to you, I've got to put it on tape, is your idea of being poor is antichrist. It's beastly. It's mark of the beast, baby. It's an idol. It's another God in your face. It's not the real you. The real you is not poor. The real you, every one of you, whew, I'll just say it like I want to say it. You're filthy rich so that you can give all that money away and evangelize the nations. Yes! By art and man's device. Art's not the little guy who lives around the corner. Art is the Greek word techne, handicraft, technology. Mark was in the hand. By art and man's device, inner reasonings. Watch this. What's an idol? It starts in a man's mind, comes through a man's hand. Mark of the beast. Idolatry. Flip it and you can shout all day. Revelation 14 is the mark of the Lord. And what God's mind has dreamed about for your nation God's hand apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher will fashion in the earth Abraham made seven separations have I got five minutes thank you, it's all I need as I look at your school as I look at Dez, as I look at his wife as I look at this school I'll tell you right now, you guys have come through five of them. And what you're going to wrestle with now is number six. You've already made your separation. Am I talking to the right crowd? 
Nothing or no one can talk you out of it. Come on. The world's behind you. Come on, somebody. You made your separation from Lot, who's kin to Naomi. <laughs> Yay. The desire to get wealth, that's not in your heart. The problem with me and you right now, we're number six. Nobody's into number seven yet, and I'll show you why as I close. Because the seven separations from Isaac. The sixth separation is the one we're working on now. That's another word for the threshing floor, circumcision, baptism of fire, all that stuff in Ruth 3. Only it takes this track. It's when you take matters into your own hands. Sarah said to Abraham, maybe, old man, it may be, Genesis 16, 1 through 4, it may be you'll get her pregnant. There's always a maybe. See, that's man's thinking. Maybe this will work. A good idea brought forth by my strength. That's the mark of the beast. It's American church. God help us. And the greatest temptation now and an aberration of it, a manifestation of it, is this bishop thing in America. The time of true promotion is near. What are people doing? They're taking matters into their own hands. I'm bishop so-and-so, I'm apostle so-and-so, I'm prophet so-and-so. If you don't call me that, I'll be upset. And you know what, you know what, well, you pray for me. Every time I go back to America, I go back mad. Pray for my church Sunday morning. You ought to leave me alone the first three weeks I'm back home. I'll hurt you. I'll hurt you. Why? Because I'm upset. Why? Because in America, the preachers, I'm about preachers. I'm a preacher's preacher. I'm a teacher's teacher. And in America, <laughs> you're so wonderful. You're so sweet. You learn, need to learn to delegate, though. At the table, I need a cup of tea. Well, let me get that for you. Sit down. <laughs> but it's his nature. Do you love this man? Yes. Do you love this woman? Yes. You better. It's Abraham and Sarah, and I'm getting ready to prophesy to both of them. He's a servant. In America, preachers want you to serve them. No! He that be greatest among you, let him be servant of all. The seven separations from Isaac. What's that? That's when God drops the promise in your lap. You feel it breathing against you. It's warm. It's alive. And God said, now that I've given you everything I've told you, give it to me. God hasn't given you everything he told you yet. God hasn't given me everything but when that moment comes, the seventh separation is from Isaac. And that's where you love the giver, not the gift. And there's faith in your spirit. He can have it all. And he can resurrect it if he has to. And if he doesn't have it, he can make it. God, that'll preach. Now I want to tell you where we're headed. Would you like to know where we're headed as a people? After seven separations, God made no more requirements on Abraham brought him into an unlimited provision and showed him his name Jehovah Jireh I am the Lord who sees and provides I want to prophesy mom could you come here quick because this is to you come come quick we got some tape left huh about two minutes three minutes good hold hands hear your faith this way I had an open vision of the Lord while I was teaching. Now look at me. Look at me. You got to see what I saw. I had a vision of the Lord in the last 15 minutes. I wasn't even going to do this, but the Lord said do it. I see a mountain. I see Des and his sweetie walking up the mountain on one side in the visible realm. I see in the invisible realm, the other side of the mountain, a ram walking up the mountain. You know the story. Isaac said to, to Abraham, he said, Papa, where's the sacrifice? And then those awesome words, God will provide himself. That's up. God will provide himself. The ram of substitution. The ram caught in a thicket. Jesus caught in this sin-cursed world. It's, it's too big a picture, the father and the son. Only the father and son go up the mountain. Servant stays at the bottom. It's a revelation of worship, verse 5. We go up, we go yonder to worship. Worship is sacrifice. I could teach all that. Here's the word of the Lord. I saw you ascending. What's the mountain? God's plan for this school. Vision, destiny. I saw you ascending the mountain, and in the invisible realm, I saw the ram of consecration. 
and the ram of substitution ascending. In moments of weakness and discouragement, you stopped ascending, the lamb stopped. And when you started going up, it went up. And you went up, and it went up. You stopped, it stopped. Thus saith the Lord, I will meet you at the top of the mountain in a manifestation of my name. It's the word of the Lord. What name? I will see and I will provide everything we need, says the Lord. Because this man, this woman, will give their Isaac, and then the Lord will say, he's not yours, he's not mine, he's ours. Whew, stretch your hand out and pray in tongues for them, quick. Everything they need, Lord. Come on, release provision. Release everything they need. In the name of Jesus. Woo. Jesus. And you know why God's going to do it? He says, I know my servant Abraham. He'll command his sons. Now, this is going to appear self-serving. I don't even care at this point how it appears. He said, bring a good offering tonight. Not just for me. I'll end up giving it to somebody else. I know Abraham. He'll command his sons. God is just waiting. I prophesy this, to put an unlimited provision. I'm writing a book over an F1. When Moses and his church came out of Egypt, they came out wealthy, and there wasn't a feeble one among them. When Jesus made his exodus, Moses and Elijah came. Moses to talk to him about his decease. The Greek word is exodus. Jesus has his exodus at the cross. And when he came out of his Egypt, he rent the veil and loosed everything. And now there's a man-child, a mature church, that's going to fulfill Isaiah 60, where the forces of the Gentiles, literally the wealth of the nations, and where it says in Revelation 21 and 22 that the nations of the earth will come into the house of the Lord and bring their glory and their honor. I didn't know it till this morning, about 6 o'clock while writing. That word means it's going to bring their valuables. It's a Queen of Sheba thing, folks. She's coming with her praise and her money. And for faithful people who've been delivered from a love of it and who've been delivered not so much from stinginess, because y'all aren't stingy. Your greatest need is you don't believe you're either worthy of it or supposed to have it or you're afraid to have it because you're afraid it might contaminate you. All that's burned with fire. Say this with me, I dare you. Say, God desires to make me, as the seed of Abraham, a wealthy person, a steward of a great amount of money. I dare you to go to God and talk that over with him. After he gave it away to Lot, God said, come up here, boy. You just made a separation. Now look to the source, the north, the south, the east, and the west. You can have it all, including what Lot just chose. And if he looked to the north, the south, the east, and the west, I'll prophesy this to you. He was standing right in the middle of the promise. You're blessed just to come on this campus because this man and this woman are standing right in the middle of the promise of God. They're working through Ishmael like we all are. And when God gives Isaac and they give it back, this man's name will be a household name in this nation. Maybe it already is. Because God will have given him a complete, com a complete provision and the revelation of a name that few will know. Jehovah Jireh. The favor 
the supernatural favor of the Lord where God just speaks to people and says, that's my man, that's my woman. If somebody walked up to me today, let the tape run out, if somebody walked up to me today and slapped a million bucks in my hand, it wouldn't move me or phase me. I know where it needs to be spent. I believe that somebody's going to give us a gift around a, the size of $100,000 before this project is over. That's where I put my faith now. And I'm going to ask God when we move into that building two years from now, it'll be paid for. And we don't even need the building. But our Bible college is going on the second floor. The flags of the nations will surround the property. And right there in little old Richlands, North Carolina, a town of 1,200 people, God will leave a witness. Not the building, but the people of what he can do when you believe him. you got to know where I came from. And you got to know that I don't possess things. And I don't let them possess me. I don't really care. I've got two sons coming up in my house who are just like me. Mama gets upset with them. You just give it all away, just like your father. And I have to say, Mama, I love you, darling. I want to make love to you, baby. But you're thinking like a Pentecostal. It's our only hope, Mama. Why did I come to your land bearing seed? I planted seed because I need a miracle. I've enjoyed this session today more than any other. Why? Because you talked about yourself? No, it gave me a break from... Gave my mind a break. I didn't have to focus so much. Just told your story. Pray for me this afternoon. I'm going to finish the book. And tonight, I'm going to preach. You've got a homework assignment. What is? One and two of Matthew. One and two of Luke. Tonight, I'm not going to summarize what I've preached. I'm just going to tell you, you're pregnant with the seed of God. And there's absolutely nothing that can keep it from coming forth. Bring your shouter tonight. Bring your dancing shoes. Bring your crazy praise. And we'll see you there. has been releasing people into their ministry for over 30 years. Established in 1969, this facility has had a profound impact on the lives of thousands of people from all over the world as they have come to learn of God's Word and be instructed in the fundamentals of Christian evangelism and teaching. Faith Bible College is situated 15 minutes from downtown Tauranga in the quiet rural setting of Welcome Bay and has plenty to offer students in their spare time. Great beaches, hot pools, waterfalls, walks, and plenty of on the edge activities. The grounds at Faith Bible College are spacious, yet provide a nice community atmosphere. Accommodation is in the form of single rooms, married and family units, as well as shared dwellings, which cater for two to four people. Meals prepared by our qualified chefs are held in the dining room and provide an opportunity for relaxed fellowship. The teachers at Faith Bible College are among the most respected lecturers in New Zealand. The principal, Des Short, is a renowned speaker who provides significant insight into Christian teaching. The mission of the college is to glorify God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to assist the church in fulfilling the mandate of the Great Commission.
which is to preach the gospel and to make disciples of all the nations. In coming to faith, they're going to experience heart knowledge because there's nothing worse than just gaining knowledge about God and not coming to know Him personally. And what we've discovered with those that spend time with us here at Faith, they come to know the Lord in a very personal, intimate way. And then they're able to move out in the power of the Holy Spirit to manifest His character and His life wherever He leads them. There are a variety of courses available and Faith Bible College invites applications from people who are committed to Jesus Christ and His Kingdom. Students are admitted in February and July and are drawn from many ethnic and denominational backgrounds. But they share a common goal, to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to today's world. I came to Faith because of their involvement in missions and their focus on world evangelism. My confidence has grown a lot in the practical side of things like speaking in front of people because I've been taught how to do it. It's a very good Bible college. Uh, there's very good support, very good standard of lecturing, uh, covers a good range of subjects and there's also a lot of support for personal growth and development as well. I found it extremely beneficial mixing with other Christians from other backgrounds. It's very quiet, it's well set out, it's a good place to be. The people here are really real, I mean the lecturers are amazing and they're just easy to talk to and that just knowing that you've got that spiritual covering, you've got people that are praying for you and you can just go and talk to them and I love the environment, I love Tauranga, I love the surf and the beach and that's just a neat place to take time out and spend time seeking God. It's been a real character building experience. I needed to grow closer to the Lord. I felt that uh, I needed to uh, have a closer walk with the Lord and know God deeper in a deeper manner and also to know His Word in a deeper sense. I have more confidence now to serve the Lord because I have been given opportunities in this college to go out and serve the Lord. Courses are registered with the New Zealand Qualifications Authority and students who require financial assistance are eligible to apply for student loans and allowances. One of the reasons for Faith Bible College's popularity is the variety of activities the students are involved in. Students normally start each day with devotions and worship, followed by lectures. Each afternoon, other activities take place, including sports, prayer meetings, hour of power, work parties and electives such as singing, drama, dance, worship leading and even car maintenance. Other attractions of Faith Bible College are that students are able to rub shoulders with other cultures and obtain practical ministry exposure both within New Zealand and overseas. As students are learning, their knowledge is put to practical use. Students become involved with various outreaches, such as church ministries, prison ministries, mission organizations, and secular groups. We give them practical training, and then we send them out into in team situations to a wide variety of opportunities within Tauranga and beyond the Bay of Plenty. It could be as simple as taking a children's talk within a church situation, it could be as simple as working with the Cool Bananas Ministry that reach almost 2,000 kids every week here in Tauranga and learning behind the scenes skills of that ministry. It could be going to the prisons, it could be going to the rest homes, it could be going out into the community and doing practical works, demonstrating love and care for other people. Some have been to places like Kazakhstan and Central Asia, Philippines, Central China, Africa, the US, other nations as well. And there's just a, a, a a growing confidence of who they are, for a start. A growing confidence of the gifts and the, and the skills that are developing. Things that they learned in the secular world, they are now seeing an application for the sake of the kingdom. And, this, and uh, there's a more, the great assurance of where they're going. The opportunities after graduating from Faith Bible College are endless. Some students go on to attend other colleges. Some become attached to their home church as missionaries while others become involved in full-time Christian work. There are over 4,000 graduates now in 56 countries. 
doors open as they have made themselves available and sought God's direction. At Faith Bible College, you will be taught to be bold, upright, and full of God's power, faith, and love. Faith Bible College is giving a call. Are you prepared to answer that call?